um, the series. I'm really delighted to, uh, to welcome Dr. Brandon Jones from the National Science Foundation. So Dr. Jones is a uh, marine biologist and biochemist, and he has spent much of his career in public service. He worked at a, as a program officer at the EPA. He's now at NSF, where he works on programs including geopaths, uh, the tribal colleges and universities program, uh, the HBCU Excellence in Science program, and the Go uh, Geo Opportunities for Leadership program, which some of you may know is the GOLD program. Um, so Brandon is going to be talking to us on challenges and opportunities for increasing participation of underrepresented groups in the geosciences. And over to you, Brandon. Thank you so much, uh, Greg, and to those that have organized this summer session. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. I was looking forward to being there in person. I think the meeting was supposed to be um, in May, but obviously uh, things have changed. But we are here and we're here to share. I'm going to go ahead and see if we can start this slideshow. If someone could let me know that they can see that. Yes, this is perfect. Right. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I, I think I have around 14, 15 minutes. I want to move through these slides. Uh, the slides can be shared later on. I'm, I'm giving permission for that to, to, to happen. Uh, and we also have the follow-up uh, breakout session, as, as Greg mentioned, so looking forward to more discussion there. But uh, here's the title. And, and I have on this uh, first slide three books that um, have helped frame this conversation, or at least my thoughts about this conversation over the past uh, three years. And uh, just I, I just wanted to put those books out there as uh, potential sources of information for individuals to, uh, you know, if you're really interested in the in the topic, uh, to to dig in. There's a whole lot of literature out there, not just books, but also uh, published literature from um, uh, geoscientists as well as social scientists around this issue. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute. So um, let's just jump into the discussion. Many of you may have, may, maybe not, um, have seen this paper. It came out in 2018 by Bernard and Cooper Doc. Uh, this, they used NSF data, uh, the title, and it was in uh, Nature. And the title there is, is Stark, uh, No Progress on Diversity in 40 Years in the Geosciences. But they mainly looked at uh, the number of PhDs, uh, in, as you see, uh, in the geoscience, geoscience disciplines, and they were looking at people of color with PhDs. And so really the emphasis uh, of the paper, or the point of the paper is that, uh, you know, four decades later after targeted efforts and programs and emphasis in REUs and uh, emphasis at institutions and, and funding agencies, et cetera, uh, something is happening between all of the individuals that have been recruited maybe at the undergrad or the early pipeline level, and there's all of this attrition that happens by the time they're moving into or attempting to move into academic positions. So you see um, uh, the numbers at the bottom are they're, they're just basically flat for all uh, groups of color in the geosciences. There is a little bump uh, for Asian and non-Hispanic uh, um, peoples around 95. I'm not sure what that is, but again, uh, this, these are NSF data sources. Um, so the, the main take homes as, as we're moving along is that uh, one, the STEM workforce cannot operate at full capacity if all available and qualified minds are not engaged. Um, and individuals who are in the workforce, and this is any sector, they cannot operate at full capacity if there's stress. So if you're just thinking about um, ecological law, um, organisms can operate the best in optimal zones. And that's what we would like for all human beings who are engaging in any type of work and really importantly in the sciences and as we're talking about geoscience disciplines. Um, and thirdly, our planet's facing all hands on deck problems. It doesn't matter what it is, uh, any sector, uh, but all hands are not on deck and all hands have not been on deck over, we could say centuries in this country and much longer in other parts of the world. Um, and it's, it's time for um, everyone to be able to bring all of themselves to whatever it is that they're engaging in, in particular in the sciences. When we're talking about science, 
uh, and actually when we're talking about diversity and equity and inclusion issues, what we're talking about is bringing in multiple perspectives. We do that as scientists. We always, um, uh, as part of the scientific process, we collect data, uh, we write, we analyze it, we write it up, we publish, and part of the publishing process is peer review because we want other perspectives. We want to make sure everything that we are putting out, um, it has been uh, critiqued to whatever level uh, by experts. And so uh, we should certainly apply that that process to engaging people from different backgrounds. And so that's what this is about. It's bringing in different perspectives. Um, and when tackling uh, Jedi issues, and Jedi is, uh, yes, that's a, that's a nod to Star Wars, but really Jedi is an acronym that stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion. Um, so that's what the acronym will, as I refer to, you'll, you'll know what it means. So when tackling these issues as scientists, we want solutions, uh, but we understand we can't collect as much data or all the data that we need. Our sample sizes are small when we're dealing with groups of people that we're trying to recruit in, et cetera. Um, and so uh, often we have to make up assumptions to fill in the blanks. And that's okay, we do that when we collect data. We make assumptions and we incorporate or we ensure that the assumptions are part of our analysis, our statistical process or whatever. So having assumptions, it, it, you know, everyone has assumptions, but we have to make sure that they are disclosed um, and that they're dealt with properly. So, um, but when we're talking about engaging uh, underrepresented groups, uh, we have to ensure that our uh, assumption, we have to know where the source of those assumptions are so that we can deal with them if they happen to be barriers. So for instance, this book, um, it, The Loudest Duck, is based on uh, an idea that uh, in China that parents and teachers teach students about the loudest duck. And um, the loudest in the US or in Western society, we have a saying where the squeaky wheel gets, and I think some of you probably have already answered that either out loud or in your head, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's the way that we train our students, we train our undergrads, we train early career faculty. You have to speak up, you have to be at the table, you have to advocate for yourself, et cetera. But in China with the loudest duck, which would be uh, the analog to the squeaky wheel, okay? Uh, in, China, in China, the loudest duck get shot. The loudest duck does not get the grease. And so say for instance that uh, you had Chinese students in your lab or in your class or you were engaging with Chinese colleagues, etc. cetera, uh, you have to be aware that your Western idea of how they engage in the science process may be different from yours. And trying to place them into a system that doesn't allow them to be all of themselves because of their thousands of years of cultural history, well, that's just, that's inappropriate, okay? So we have to be aware of where people are coming from. We also have to be aware of what we've been taught in this country and uh, from our, from kindergarten on up about certain subjects, uh, in particular with the history of the country. So, and then we end up being faced or we have, we're, we're squarely, um, uh, have to deal with a, a, a mirror effect uh, about really looking at ourselves and reflecting on what we were taught. So uh, this report here, Ethnic Cleansing in America's Creation of the National Parks. Wait a minute, everyone likes the national parks. This is where many of us in the geoscience and field sciences, especially in the earth science disciplines, we go, we're in national parks all the time. Um, and maybe I, we hadn't thought about how did the national park system actually come about? Um, and if you read the report, you see that uh, there was an unpeopled fallacy that was pushed uh, to create the national park system, if you weren't aware. John Muir, we, we know where he sits within um, ec the ecological and, and historical um, context as far as being a person who who, who pushed forward the, the understanding of conservation, et cetera, natural conservation. But uh, he did push forward an uninhabited wilderness uh, mantra uh, that prevailed. And one of the reasons that Mir's vision prevailed is in this particular um, uh, paragraph from the article where it says, through the existence of this drastic change of paradigms, 
It's readily apparent from the writings of Catlin, who, who identified that Native Americans were part of the wilderness, uh, uh, of the wilderness and Mir. The more difficult question is why Mir's perspective arose and prevailed. And in red, I have there, the answer is around the time that, that this idea was being discussed and pushed, there was increased racism against uh, Native Americans. And so we have to be, we're now faced when, oh my gosh, when what I've been taught over all of these years is tarnished by actual truth, then we're running into how do we deal with truth? And I can't think of a sector that is more qualified to deal with truth other than science. So, so that's also a layer that we want to want to make sure that we can grapple with. Okay. Uh, again, back to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the sciences. As I mentioned before, we make assumptions because we don't have all the data. Uh, but often, if we have our, if we're biased, that we have biases that we're unaware of, unconscious, et cetera, uh, having those biases and using assumptions then to maybe create programs or uh, sit on tenure and promotion committees or awards committees, uh, we could often do some damage if we're not aware of the bias that is then that rides the assumption as we are sitting in these uh, places of power. So for instance, over the years, and some of you may have been involved in programs or even developed um, uh, different activities uh, to, to increase the numbers of underrepresented groups. There was a big push over the last 30 years, I would say, we just need to get more people of color. We need to get more women. We need to, we need to target uh, this recruitment effort uh, in, in those um, communities to increase the numbers. But we never thought about, or maybe some did, um, where we were recruiting them into, okay? So we sold uh, the early career faculty position as, oh, come to this university or be a researcher in, at this facility or um, come to this REU, it, it's gonna change your life, it's gonna be awesome. We have this, all these great mentors and these great research activities, et cetera. Uh, but the student's experience was not what was sold to them because it was all about the recruitment and bringing them in, but it wasn't about dealing with the environment and the toxicity um, that they then moved into, the isolation or, or what have you. So as we're moving forward into really digging into the details of, of this work and, and making sure all individuals can bring all of themselves, we have to ensure that the program environment is such that, that individuals can thrive. We wouldn't go to the pet store and, and buy a fish and come home and the fish dies. Then we go back to the pet store, buy another fish and come home and that fish dies. And then we wanna blame the pet store. It might be your water quality. So we, we are at a point now, um, and of course with all the civil discussion and the, and the civil unrest that, that's going on in, in this country and around the world, at a point where we really gotta look at our environments, micro, macro, wherever, where individuals are, are moving into so that they can thrive and bring those perspectives that we talked about earlier. The issue uh, with uh, natural scientists, I'll say, as, as being a natural scientist, is that I'm interested in, in this diversity work, um, and I'm approaching it as I would approach any, any other effort as far as science is concerned, but I don't have that expertise to deal with humans and human behavior, okay? Because this issue that we're facing as far as diversity in, in the science is concerned is a sociological problem. It's not a problem with science. It's not a problem with research. This is a human problem. And if you have problems or you need to under, have a better understanding of how humans are interacting, then you need social scientists to be part of the discussion to bring in the appropriate methods uh, and, and to, to help deal with this issue. One of the problems is natural scientists still have a bias against social scientists. That's not real science. Uh, that, that's not, you, you can't reproduce it because of wh whatever group that they did the survey on, how can anyone reproduce that, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to deal with our own discipline biases if we're really going to, to move forward in this area. 
So some, some considerations, and, and I'll try to, to move through these quickly so we'll have a little bit of time for discussion, understanding that we started late. Um, so the big picture in the United States, because a lot of this is not just a Western issue, it's a US specific issue, uh, especially when you're talking about racism. We have to uh, understand and peel back what we were taught, as I mentioned earlier, about America being a melting pot and America being a land of immigrants and all of those things. That, that's just not true because Native Americans, Mexican Americans of Puerto Rican, well, really natives, Mexicans of Puerto Ricans weren't immigrants, they were already here. And people of African descent were brought over here. They weren't immigrants, they didn't come over here on their own. So all of these groups were involuntarily incorporated into the US and it just so happens that these are the groups that we've had issues with as far as inclusion for the last four centuries. So we have to really go back and look at how the US was founded, how it was built, and the systems that still perpetuate uh, these barriers for certain people, in particular people of color. So one consideration, if you're dealing with colleagues of color, students of color, uh, what have you, you have friends, you have church members, you're in, in a professional society, a GSA or AGU or what have you, let people of color tell their own stories. I hear oftentimes people say, we want to give a voice to these people. They have a voice. How about you just be the speaker system? Okay, they, you don't need to give them anything. They have it, but they're not, they haven't been allowed to express it. And so that's one thing that we can do is let them tell their own stories and also let them have their own spaces. Because oftentimes there, if there's, there's that one person of color in the lab or in the office or in the department, they're isolated already. And they may be isolated in some other layers that you're unaware of. So sometimes they just need to be by themselves or find uh, their community. And that's okay for them to do that. Another consideration, critical self-reflection uh, by white colleagues and white administrators. And this is mainly targeted at um, institutions of higher learning, universities, colleges, et cetera. And there's a whole suite of uh, information and, and uh, journal articles in this particular uh, uh, volume of the Journal of Geoscience Education that uh, gives all kinds of insight from all kinds of experts on how how to go about doing that. A uh, few other points, recognition that bias impacts tenure, promotion, and awards. There has to be a recognition. If you're sitting on these committees or you have sat on these committees and you reflect, or maybe you've been on the negative side of that, uh, that this is a real thing. And it's that assumption and bias piece that oftentimes causes the barrier in the promotion and the career advancement of people of color. Mentoring, support, assistance, and allyship. Allyship, allyship is key. This is a system issue, as well as there's a, a bit of human issue, but we're all gonna have to work at this together. And we need allies all from all areas, all sectors, all colors uh, to help uh, move these things forward. And uh, this is the last slide, take home message. Develop cross racial relationships. And this is going to involve if you're really serious about this, having to sit in difficult conversations, having to deal with emotional expressions uh, and, and not shying away or not backing away from that. It, it's going to happen, and, but we can be respectful as it happens, uh, but we need people not to get so uncomfortable that they move away. It's going to be uncomfortable develop racial stamina, and that's part of uh, th those two first, that first and second bullet kind of go together. Be human, you know, if you see someone at a meeting, just speak to them, you know, don't, don't act like you don't see them. Don't, we don't want to hear, well, I don't see color. I was brought up not to see color. That's not helpful because people, there are people of color. So if you say you don't see color, then you're saying you don't see them. And now you're dehumanizing them in a way that you really probably didn't mean to. And so, and I'm guilty of that on the opposite. So I have to constantly remember I'm a human, they're a human. I can at very at least just speak to them and say, good morning, hello, how are you? Last point, it's okay to be quiet and just listen. 
Uh, I know that's hard lots of times for scientists because we like to talk, we like to discuss ideas, et cetera, but different cultures operate differently when it comes to vocabulary, communication, et cetera. So to do a little bit of homework and then just to sit and listen and uh, try to walk in that individual's shoes as you're listening. And again, uh, be human and, and just recognize that everyone needs an opportunity to thrive and bring all of themselves so they can operate at full capacity uh, in the science enterprise. And that way the science enterprise can then operate at a much higher capacity than it is now. So I'll stop there um, and stop sharing my screen and turn thing. I guess we have time for questions, Greg uh, or Lynn. Do we have time? Yeah, we should have time. I'm gonna turn it over to Albert to moderate questions. Okay, thanks, Albert. Thank you for your talk, Brandon. It was quite insightful, and, and I remember some, or, or I see so many things uh, uh, that you brought up uh, that that apply here for for the University of Colorado. So, it's, so it's a great start of this summer series. I think. Uh, let's see if anybody has a question here in the chat, and if I can see that or not. So, if you have a question, please. Um, go to the bottom of your screen. There is a participants button. I think if you click on that there should be a raise hand and that will actually put a little blue hand up there for me to see so then I can unmute you and I see one. Why is this not so? Okay, I'm gonna try to I see Nicole raised her hand. Chat, could you maybe unmute her? I cannot. I, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. yes. Hi, Brandon. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm a professor in a earth science department, and my experience has been that some of our most insightful comments and ideas are coming from our students, our graduate students and our undergraduate students. And I was wondering, um, I as a faculty member would like to be a bridge for these students. I would like to be able to voice um, their ideas to the faculty, because as you know, faculty can be very hierarchical. Um, do you have any suggestions as to how we can, as faculty, set up spaces where students feel comfortable talking to us? Because that has been one of, once I can have the students talk to me, I hear so many good ideas, but there's this trust issue um, mm -hmm. that is very hard to break down. Right. So, so are these students needed just a tad bit more information? Are, are these students of color or they're just they? Uh, so what I, my experience has been with students of color, so um, American citizen students of color, but then also um, students of color who may be coming from different countries, um, but who still experience otherness, um, if that makes yeah. sense. No, that, that you're, that's a great point. The, the otherness, for instance, uh, all African, all students of African descent aren't the same. So for instance, if you have a Jamaican student or a student from Trinidad and a student from Philadelphia, they may all look this, they may all have the same skin color, but they're totally different. Um, so yeah, so that you, you bring up a, you know, a, a interesting point. There's a couple of things going on probably three things I could think of. So there's the, the, the model of academic preparation, which is being challenged right now. It's been challenged probably in the last 10 years of the master apprentice model uh, and professors have students, uh, but because undergraduate training is changing and students are, are a little older, they're non-traditional, they can get, some courses online and some at a community college, so they don't really need to go to a four-year institution. So all of that is challenging, and I don't have an answer for that, other than recognizing the challenges and, and figuring out ways to provide students those spaces to express their ideas. There's also a generational uh, diversity layer here. Mm -hmm. Just the, the, when people were born and what was going on in society at the time has shaped how they approach work and even approach science. So young people are so much more collaborative because they've grown up in a time with social media and personal computers and they, they, they just 
all, they just know how to connect with each other. Uh, but that flies in the face of you need to do your own research, you know. So um, I would say for you, as you, you know, um, to to be an ally is maybe to ask them what they need, and and you know, create a space for them to to trust you and to feel comfortable with each other, and then ask them what do you need, and how can I help you be the bridge and and move forward, and then you'll have to do maybe some some of your own strategic thinking on how to move their ideas up, up the chain to the, to the faculty, faculty, senate department, chair, head, whoever. So um, I hope yeah. 